when it comes to 21 days of revival, um, I think I've got 18 left in me. But um, I hope this is not the last day of revival. I would say the next day is going to be on Sunday when this revival continues. Um, so I hope you have that attitude uh, as we continue to go forth. And that's really what tonight is about. Is I'm going to talk about a church that was doing it right. A church that Paul actually compliments, uh, which is somewhat rare if you read through some of his letters to churches. Is they're mainly meant to correct churches that are doing wrong, of course, to edify them and lift them up and give them right direction. And uh, this church wasn't perfect by any means, but he starts with a really good beginning here where he compliments them, which is, like I say, rare for the Apostle Paul. So we're going to get into what this church was doing right and then why I call this a full circle church. But first, I want to start with prayer. Father, we are thankful just for who you are, for your faithfulness to us. I thank you for each person that you have led here tonight to hear your word. And we just put it all on you and your word and your spirit tonight to move. As I do this, I just pray that you'll speak through me in a mighty way, that it will be your words to your church. And that you will just bring change and revival and just a renewed spirit that can only come through you as we continue to seek you and follow you as your people. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you would, um, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to read just the first uh, well, I guess it's going to end up being all of chapter 1, but it's a short chapter. It's just 10 verses. Um, and in this, like I said, you have a church that's doing it right. So let me give you the context as we go into the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, Paul visited the church here in Thessalonica. That's the city, a city in Greece, Thessalonica, that Paul goes and visits on his second missionary journey. And if you want to see how things went there and what happened in that city, you can read about that in Acts 17. Because it gives you the details of how these people were led to Christ and some events that I'm going to mention in a minute. And so he goes then and leaves Thessalonica out of fear, really. I can't say that Paul was afraid, but they sent him out because a riot had started because the gospel was there. And people had received this message and it caused a stir in the town. And so Paul leaves in the darkness of night. And he moves on to Berea and then to Athens and then to Corinth on his missionary journey. And as time passes, he begins to worry about those people in Thessalonica. And so he sends his partner, Timothy, there, his co-laborer. And he says, Timothy, I want you to go and check on that church in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians. And I want you to give me an update on how they're doing. Because he knew that they had been persecuted in a sense. And, and that it had caused a disruption when their faith happened. And so he's worried about this church. But the report that he gets back from Timothy is a great report. And so this part here, this verses that were written in chapter 1 is really a prayer. It's a prayer of thanksgiving to God for what God had done in the hearts and minds of these people. And the way I read it, if you really read through the whole book, I think by the time Paul gets the message back from Timothy, Paul himself knows that this church is in good standing. So let's look tonight at what this church did right. So read with me in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 1 to 10. It says, Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the sight of our God and Father, Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in as much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what matter of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus 
who delivers us from the wrath to come. And as you look at these verses, I think you really see all aspects of, of all three nights here of what we're doing. Where you see there it says they turn from idols to serve the living God. That's exactly what Joshua was doing in chapter 24, our first night. And then you're going to see here that their faith was evident, which is what we talked about last night. That as a Christian, we're commanded to grow spiritually, become more like Christ. And so we're going to put that all together tonight. And I'm going to give you a challenge as Little Stevens Creek Baptist Church and say, if you do what this church right here was doing, then you're going to please not only your pastor here, not only me, but the Lord, which is your mission. So let's see what they're doing right. Why was this church a church doing it right. And I want you to first see what it does not mention. There's no mention here of buildings or facilities. It had nothing to do with what, how big their church was, if they had a church gym, uh, what they had to offer people. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with the staff. It doesn't mention anybody by name. Right? Paul came, shared the message. People believed a church was formed. And then he talks about the church as a whole, the saved people going out and working. It makes no mention of anybody getting paid anything or salaries. It makes no mentions of programs or anything like that, outreach movements or anything that drew people in. None of that. And I think that's what we normally think of with churches, right? No mention of music, which always becomes a topic with churches, which means those things are not the core values of a church. That's not why you should even choose a church. All those are secondary or tertiary things. The main things are right here. The number one thing that I see that, that this church was doing right is that, number one, they trusted in Jesus. I love how he starts this letter as he says to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So they are in Christ. That is their identity. They have trusted him as a Christian. You are now in Christ and Christ is in you. That you now have come to Christ through the role of the Holy Spirit. And now you are a child of God the Father. That that is now your identity. And that's what Paul wants them to know. As he says, your identity is you are in Christ. And now your identity, everything that you do flows from your identity. And he's saying if you get your identity as a child of God, as one of his redeemed, blood-bought uh, people of God, then that's going to change the way you do everything. If you just remember that you are in Christ, that's the most important characteristic about you. That's what sets you apart. Not your name. Right? I know around here we want to know our name, first name, we want to know our last names. Right? Who's your father? Right? That's what you usually get. Who are your people? Well, that more importantly than my name or where I'm from, my address, my nationality, my race, my education, none of that really defines me. That's not my identity. My identity is I am in Christ. And now I wear the name of Christ as a Christian. And my identity now changes how I behave. And you see that, number one, they trusted Christ. And you see that over and over in these ten verses. In verse three there, it says that their hope was in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse six... It says they became followers of the Lord. And then in verse 10, it says that they are now waiting for his son, Jesus, who is raised from the dead to save them from the wrath to come. That's their whole thing is their hope is in him. They are following him. They are serving him and they are waiting on him. That's what it means to be in Christ. That's the number one thing they did right. That's what it means to be the church. The church are the blood bought redeemed of Jesus Christ that you have been paid for and purchased through his payment and atonement on the cross. And that's what all the Bible is working toward from Genesis all the way through Revelation, things even to come, is a storyline of what God has done to redeem his people through Christ for his glory. And you see that all through, that it comes down to who is Jesus Christ. And John 3 is one of the biggest chapters in the Bible where you learn about being born again, where they ask Jesus, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? He says, you must be born again. And that's what you see here is these are born again people with a new life and a new direction. But also in John 3, when you get to the last verse of John 3, John 3, 36, it says, whoever believes in the son has everlasting life. And whoever does not believe in the son will not see life for God's wrath abides on him. Now think about that verse. It means God wrath, God's wrath is upon me as a sinner until I come to Christ. Because Christ, that payment on the, his perfect life and then that payment on the cross where he died for my sins, that appeases the wrath of God. And so think of the importance of the son, Jesus. I think of Acts 4.12, which says salvation is found in no one else. 
For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It is Jesus or it is nothing. He's the only way to God. Jesus himself says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Now, how do you have that relationship? It comes through repenting of sin, right? Changing your mind about your sin and, and your way and then turning to God's way. It's a change of mind that changes your behavior. That's what repentance is. And you see that in verse 9. In verse 9 of this text, it says, For they themselves declare concerning what matter of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's repentance. Is they were serving false gods and themselves, and they turn and they start worshiping the true God. So number one, they put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. I hope tonight you have made that decision. That you will place your faith and your trust in Jesus. Is He your Savior? Is He your Lord? Do you actually follow Him? Is your hope in Him? Are you waiting on His return? That's the whole song He just sang for us. All that was in that song. Is we have to understand that we have to repent and now trust Jesus as our Lord. And if you haven't made that decision, do it tonight. But I want you to also see in this... That you see how salvation really works. You see how it happens. Because you see the work of the triune God. Now we believe in the Trinity. Right? We know the doctrine of the Trinity. That we serve a triune God. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Working in unison in all things. And you see it in these ten verses. God the Father is mentioned eight times in these ten verses. Did y'all see that? A few of them I'll mention in verse 2. It says we give thanks to God. In verse 4, he says that God has chosen them. In verse 9 that I just read, they turn to God, the living God, instead of these idols. And there's eight references to God the Father through there. That God has, has drawn them to him. Then Jesus Christ is mentioned seven times in these ten verses. If you know, I think that's just over and over. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, where he is... Making sure we get that. Then in verse 3, our hope is in Him. In verse 6, they're following Him. In verse 10, they're waiting on His return. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit is mentioned twice, right in the center. Verses 5 and 6, where it says, basically, the Holy Spirit took the Word and called them in power and assurance and in joy to follow Christ. That's the, part of the role of the Holy Spirit. You see all three working as a, as a, in unison here to bring people to God. Salvation is of the Lord. That is a quote in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I love the one in Revelation 7 where we're seated around the throne and we're singing, Salvation is of the Lord and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. All of this is the work of God. So I want you to understand that, that salvation is a gift. Right? We've gone through that this week, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God so that we can't boast. So number one, they put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. If this church wants to be a full circle church, a church that's doing it right, it has to be through the name and the power of Jesus Christ. Number two, the second thing that I see is this church, they were a people of the word, the Bible. And I see that in three different ways. The first one is in verse five. It says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. See, these people were led to Christ through the preaching of the word. That's how it's done. That's what I'm doing right now. There is no other way. And, and I'm going to read from Acts 17 exactly how these people were led to the Lord. In Acts 17, when he goes to Thessalonica on this trip, this is what it says. Uh, chapter 17, verse 1 of Acts. Now, when they had passed through Ampil Amphilopolis and Ap Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, which means this is what he did everywhere, went to them, and for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. 
So there's where they really came to the Lord. That was the establishment of this church in Thessalonica. And how did it happen? He preached the word. And I want you to really see that, of course, he's preaching the Old Testament. He took the Old Testament scriptures that the Jewish people knew. And he said, this is this Christ. They didn't have our New Testament because he's living it. Which means you can use any part of the Bible and lead someone to Christ. We have to be people of the word. I love that one in um, Acts where Philip goes to the Ethiopian eunuch and he uses a passage from Isaiah to lead him to Christ. So think the whole Bible is a storyline that is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ and it comes through his word. That's how they were saved. They heard this word and they were convicted and they believed. That's what you see all through the Bible is it has to come down to God's word. I love Romans 1.16 where the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe. First to the Jew, then to the Greek. As he says, that's the power that brings salvation. I think of 1 Peter 1.23. Peter says, You have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. So he says we are born again through that word. In James chapter 1 verse 21, he says, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Then, of course, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God over and over. If you look at that list, it says that, it is the, that the word is the power that brings salvation. It is what it causes you to be born again. It is what saves your souls. It is what brings faith. It all comes through the word. Now, why? Right. Why does it come through that? I think it comes down to really the purpose of God's word. And if you I think a lot of people have the purpose of the Bible wrong. You know, a lot of people just use this as a book of good morals, just good teachings. Right. If I need to make a decision, then I'm going to go in here. Maybe it'll help me give me some wise sayings is what to do. Some people may even use it as a magic eight ball, right? They say, I got a decision to do. I'm just going to kind of shake it or come to a passage and it tells me what to do, right? That's not what the Bible's for. I believe the purpose of the Bible is stated in 2 Timothy 3.15. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul tells Timothy that the Holy Scriptures are there to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what 2 Timothy 3.15 says. And so think of that. These scriptures, the purpose of them is to make me wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. They lead me to knowledge of him. And that's enough knowledge to get me to see who my Lord and Savior is. To make me right with God. That's why it has to come through the word. Now, one of my favorite quotes here I'm about to read you is from Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther going back to the 1500s. Uh, who was one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation, who nailed the 95 Thesis on the, the door of the Catholic Church, which really sparks all Protestant denominations. And this is, you know, they had the Lutherans who came after, who kind of followed Martin Luther and then other uh, groups as well. And this was his quote, and I love this. He says, what is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I? Poor stinking bag of maggots that I am. Come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name. I simply talked, preached, wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did everything. Now, I love that. So he was a man of the word. He was persuaded by scripture that he was saved by faith and not works. And so he knew that all he did to spark the Protestant Reformation was just to say that the word says this and the word did the work. And I've learned that in my short time in ministry is that the word does the work. It has nothing to do with really who the pastor is. I think it's important as far as their characters and what they do, their character traits. But it comes through the word. And I've learned that. That if I'm faithful in presenting God's word, that the Holy Spirit uses it. And the word and the spirit do the work. So number one, they, they heard the word. The second way that they were people of the word is they received it. And I love this in verse six. 
It says, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit. See, when they heard it, they received it with joy. It's not they've been craving this. They were going through a difficult time, this church in Thessalonica. So they were being afflicted. But when they heard this word, they were longing for it. And they received it like a welcome guest. And I love it. If you just turn over in the next chapter, maybe not even turn, but the next chapter, verse 13. This tells you how they responded to God's word. So chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. It says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which was heard from us, you welcomed it not as word of men, but as the word of truth, as the word of God. So that was their mentality. When Paul comes and preaches this message, they realized that this wasn't the word of the Apostle Paul. This was the word of God. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. And the Thessalonians knew that and they received it that way. As God's word to them. And the third way that I see their people of the word is in verse 8. In verse 8, it says they sounded forth the word to others. This is what it says. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also to every other place. See, so they heard this word and were saved by it. They welcomed it into their lives and the word began to work within them through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then they didn't hold it and keep it, right? They let it go. They said, we've got to tell our neighbors. We have to tell those in Macedonia to the north or Achaia and the south and everywhere in between. They began to evangelize and to share that word because it all comes through God's word. Now, I think the problem, though, is it, most of us today as Christians, I think, struggle getting into God's word. I think too often we don't even read God's word. And the polls even show that. There was, there was a poll done about exactly one year ago, uh, July of 2019 by Lifeway. And out of uh, like 2,500 people that they said were Protestants like ourselves and that they were in church at least once a month. So these just might be what you call faithful Protestant people. And they did a poll of those people and they said that 32% read the Bible once a week. 32% and they only read it once a week. That's not good. Okay, we're, we need to be in the word. But I want to read you something that really ought to make us feel pretty crunchy. All right? So this is a man named Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a, a religion professor at the University of North Carolina. And he teaches some New Testament courses and some things on religion. But he's not a Christian. He, he uses the Bible in his class for part of it, but he doesn't believe the Bible. And so he has said that I teach the Bible from a historical perspective, but not from a religious or theological perspective. But this is what he said. He said, part of the deal of teaching the Bible, or no, part of the deal of teaching in the Bible Belt is that lots of my students, even most of them, have very conservative views about the Bible as the Word of God. But what I found over the years consistently is that my students have a much higher reverence for the Bible than knowledge about it. And I've found the same in my, in my students. Now, here's his actual quote of what he says he does in his classes. A few years ago, I used to start my class on the New Testament with something like 300 students in it by asking how many of you here would agree with the proposition that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And almost everyone raises their hands. Okay, great. Now, how many of you have read the entire Harry Potter series or Hunger Games series, whatever the latest novel series is? And again, almost every hand goes up. And he says, okay, how many of you have read the entire Bible? And this time, maybe only a few scattered hands here or there throughout the auditorium. And then I'd laugh. And I'd say, okay, I'm not telling you that I think the Bible is the inspired word of God. You're telling me that you think it is. I can see why you want to read a book by a great author, but if God wrote a book, and then I chuckle, wouldn't you want to see what he had to say? And when I read that, it makes me feel pretty crunchy. Right? Because how can you respond to that if you haven't read the Bible? There's nothing you can say. Right? He got us. And that's what happens to those students. You see, he gets students in there who have a great reverence for the Bible. And they say, well, I believe this is God's word, but they've never actually read it. And so what he does is he just undermines their belief. And he says, well, if God really wrote that, I believe you would have read it, which means you probably don't believe he wrote it. 
And they have nothing to say back except guilty. Right? Why do we not read it? If God really wrote this book, then we need to know what it says. Now think of that. And that's why the church at Thessalonica was a church that did it right. They were people of the Word. They were saved by it, they lived by it, and they shared it. Then the third way that these people were doing it right is they were visibly changed by their experience with Jesus Christ. Visibly changed people. And I think I can see that in four different ways. Now remember last night we even talked about a growing Christian. How when you become a Christian, you can't remain the same. That we are commanded to grow spiritually. And we should be adding to our faith those things that we went through in 1 Peter. That's what you really see here in this church in Thessalonica. And we see that it proves their salvation is genuine. Because again, we're not saved by our good works. But our good works serve as evidence of our salvation. And so that's why Paul can say, this church is doing it right because I have seen evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you. So the first way that I see that is from verse 3, where he mentions their faith, their love, and their hope. So he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. See, their work was produced by their faith. So their faith caused them to do something. Now, do you remember last night we read James 2, that faith without works is dead? So these people had faith and it began to work. So he said that your faith, their work actually there was produced by their faith. And then he says they're your labor of love, that their love caused them to labor. Right? Because I love you, I want to come and serve you. And that's how it ought to work is when you have love for people, you begin to work for them. This was not a spectator church. It just came for amusement and entertainment. This was more like a gym. They came to work out. They came to take something and then go and share it and show what they had done in the gym. To show what they had, had labored for. And then, of course, he says there that they were patient in their hope, uh, waiting for the Lord Jesus. That that caused endurance and patience and steadfastness. That their hope in Christ is what gave them patience and endurance. That they hoped for his return. That's what he said there in verse 10. That that hope of his return and the hope of, of the fact that they would be with him is what caused them to endure. To be patient amidst affliction. So their faith worked, their love labored, and their hope endured. And I would say for Little Stevens Creek Baptist Church, if you want to do it right, just think that is the vision of your church. Be a church that is set on sharing your faith, putting your hope in Christ, and laboring in your love. If you do those three things, you're going to be on the right track. So I see it there in their faith, their hope, and their love. The second way I see it in their change was in verse 5. So in verse 5, it said, The gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, as in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you. As this thing came in assurance and it came in power, that it convicted them. And I love how it says there that uh, although they were in affliction, that it also brought them joy. That th these people are going through a difficult time, but now they actually joyfully accept this word. Where it, it, it changed. It had a change within their life amidst circumstances. Now notice their circumstances didn't change. Their mindset changed. They're still under that same affliction. It's just that their attitude about the affliction has changed. So think of that. Even this world today, with all that's going on, these circumstances, I hope, are going to change quickly. But they shouldn't change our attitude about it because we're still, our identity is still in Christ. And our hope is in Him. And so therefore, even though our circumstances aren't great at this moment with COVID and the things going on in this world, we can still be the people of God. And we can still have joy and peace and hope amidst all this. That's what the people in Thessalonica did right. The third way that I see that they had changed lives is in verses 6 and 7. It says, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in affliction. That was the verse I didn't read. Okay, in joy. And also became examples. This is a great verse. They became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia and all who believe. Paul was their example, right? Paul comes and he says, You began to imitate me and the Lord. And then now people are beginning to imitate you. 
That you are becoming followers. You followed me as I followed the Lord and now people are following you. And so think that he left an impression there. It was like an exact reputation of Christ, right? An exact image of Christ. And so now they are Christ's going out. They are Christians that belong to Christ. And you can see a difference in their life. And so think, is your faith worth imitating? That's what's really challenging to me when it comes to the Apostle Paul. Is over and over, he would tell people to imitate him. To actually do what I do. Now that's a big statement, right? That's terrifying, uh, for me to think about it is tell someone, you do what I do. But he said it over and over. Here's three times that he had said it. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, he says, therefore, I urge you to imitate me. And in Philippians 3, 17, he says, brothers, join in imitating me. Over and over he says this. And so Paul will have this mentality that I'm going to go to these towns and I'm going to preach the gospel and I'm going to model the gospel. And I'm going to show what it looks like to be a Christian because I want them to visibly see what it looks like. And then I'm going to tell them that, that Christ is their Savior and now you're following Christ. But they knew of Christ through Paul. And so then he goes from town to town and now they're that imitation of Christ. Can we be an imitation of Christ? Can people want to imitate your faith? And people say, I want to be like the people at Little Stevens Creek Baptist Church. So they were followers and imitators of Paul, but more importantly, Jesus Christ. And the fourth and final way that I think they were people with a changed heart is their evangelism. Is verses 7 to 9. I want to start at verse 8. For from the, you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. And your faith toward God has gone out so that we don't need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had. You see, th their faith, their changed lives began to impact others. To where they wanted to go and share God's word with those around them. Macedonia was the area that they were in. Maybe slightly north of them could even be considered Macedonia. And so they began to sound the word right there in their community. And up north. And then it says Achaia. Now Achaia was the southern Greece. Uh, and so they were sharing the word even below them. And people below them have been impacted by the faith of that church. And of course he says the places in between as they're going. And so this is really why I think I, I would call this the full circle church. You see, they not only had a local ministry, but they had a, a national ministry and maybe even an international ministry. Because why it's a full circle is it starts with Paul. And Paul comes there and he shares the gospel with them in Thessalonica. And then they then share it with Macedonia, who then pass it to the people in Achaia and then to other places. And now word is getting back to Paul about these people. And they have literally gone full circle. Now, that's an amazing church that Paul, who is probably in Corinth. When he is writing this letter, which would have been near Achaia, the southern part. He is probably in Corinth writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica, awaiting Timothy's return. But by then, he's probably most likely, the way to read this, already heard of their faith. And now Timothy comes back and says, no, they're on fire for the Lord. And he gives him all these things. And so now they've gone full circle. Here, if you want to place this in our context right here today, it would be like me coming and sharing the gospel right here with you and challenging you to really... Set your soul on fire for God to be working in this community. And then you begin to touch those who are below us in Johnson or other things down here. And then up in Greenwood. And then all the places in between. To where now word may get back to me through David that I'm up in Greer and I hear what's happening in Little Stevens Creek Baptist Church. That's what happened here in this scene in 1 Thessalonians. It's a full circle church. From Paul to them to Macedonia, to Achaia, to other places, and back to Paul. And I want you to see the joy that this brings Paul. In chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, he talks there about sending Timothy and why he is sending Timothy to get this report. And I'm going to pick up in verse 6 of chapter 3. He says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. 
Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we are comforted concerning you by, our, by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. See, this brought Paul so much joy. Because Paul is being persecuted in every town he's going to. And so that's, really, that's why he left Thessalonica. As the crowd was out to get him because of the, the revival that had happened there. And so he now is on the run and he's being persecuted. But when he hears of their faith, it encourages him. He said, now we live if you hold fast in this gospel. It motivates him and it motivates Timothy to go and share with other people. It makes them want to evangelize even more than what they're doing because they know it works because the word works the holy spirit moves when the word is preached and so it brings them joy if you want to bring pastor david joy be a church like this if you want to bring me joy be a church like this but more importantly if you want to bring the lord joy be a church like this and i don't know why it shouldn't happen because if you trust in Jesus Christ and you're a church of the word and you're a church who has visible evidence of the work of the word and the spirit in you, this can happen. This is why that church was known in the region. It just comes down to those basic things that if you put your faith there and you put your faith in this word and then you begin to see the change that the Holy Spirit makes, you begin to evangelize, you begin to imitate Christ, you begin to reach out to other people, change happens. And then others hear about it and they want to join in. And that's my prayer and my hope for Little Stevens Creek Baptist Church and every other church that's praising God and, and following this word. So I hope you've been challenged tonight by this full circle church. And I hope that this becomes a full circle church. That word gets back to me of what's happening here in this community because of this church. Even in the midst of difficult circumstances because of trusting Jesus, his word and the visible change that can be seen. Tonight, if you need to make a decision, if you want to renew your commitment, if you just want to spend time in prayer, you respond as you need to respond. Do we have an ending song, David? Okay. So as he, he comes and, and sings, you make whatever decision you want to make. And just pray that, that the word would be heard from this pulpit, which I trust through David, it will, because I know him. And, I, and then it comes down to your trust in Jesus and opening of that word and what you're going to do about it. I'm going to end in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that, that the word has power and that your spirit moves when your word is brought. And so I pray that you'll just move in this room tonight. Uh, that you'll just lead us to decisions we need to make as your people. That we will be people of the word. That we will put our faith and trust through repentance to you, that we will turn to you from the things of this world and follow you only, and that people will see the visible change in our lives as individuals and as the church, that we will send this message forth so that others can experience this same salvation. I just thank you for this opportunity and the time I've had with this group, and I just pray that you'll use them in mighty ways. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.